Hi, I'm Tom Hughes here at Montana Molecular, and we're talking to Kevin Harlan, who's pioneered a whole new set of stress sensors that we think you ought to know about. Kevin? Thanks, Tom. Today I'd like to talk to you guys about some of our newest sensors at Montana Molecular, and these are our sensors for cellular stress. So at Montana Molecular, all of our biosensors are genetically encoded fluorescent sensors. And we've recently developed a fluorescent sensor that detects cellular stress. And this is important for monitoring stress in disease such as neurodegenerative diseases, ALS, Huntington's, Parkinson's, as well as looking at other diseases like cancer, diabetes, and then of course the classical unfolded protein response. You can also use this biosensor to detect cellular toxicity. And this would be important for, say, drug-based toxicity, such as off-target effects by chemotherapeutics, or library screening for uh, toxic compounds, or even uh, everyday compounds that may be toxic, such as the TOX21 library screen. Uh, and lastly, you can also look for uh, detrimental effects from protein overexpression from your experiments. And the way this stress sensor works is outlined below. So on the left, we have unstressed cells, and on the right, we have stressed cells. And in the unstressed cells, you'll see there is a constitutively expressed red fluorescent protein. And upon increases in cellular stress, you get expression of the green fluorescent protein, uh, indicating the amount uh, and the level of cellular stress. Great images, Kevin. Uh, are these fixed cells? No, Tom, that's a great question. These are actually live cells. And in fact, all the assays we'll be talking about today are done in live cells. And a great example of how these assays are used in live cells is shown here. We got this data from a collaborator, Joe Clayton at Biotech, using one of their fantastic high content imaging systems. And what we've done here is transduce our cell stress sensor into HEC293 cells and then treated those cells with a chemical known as thapsigargan, which induces endoplasmic reticulum stress. And you can see that over time, while the red fluorescence uh, slowly increases due to cellular proliferation, the green fluorescence spikes after addition of the thapsigargan and then diminishes as the cells recover from cellular stress. This is great, Kevin. So uh, how hard is it to do this kind of an experiment? Ah, that's a really good question, Tom, and the answer is really easy. So all of our sensors, including the stress sensor, come packaged in BACMAM, which is a type of viral delivery system. So on day one, you transduce the cells, and on day two, you're ready to image, put on the plate reader, or do any assay that uh, you're trying to test for cellular stress. So another great example of using this stress sensor is through what I would call genetic perturbations. And here what I'm showing you are uh, the cell stress sensor in two different types of uh, genetic perturbations. One is looking at rhodopsin, and that's what we have pictured down on the bottom. On the left are cells that were transduced with the cell stress sensor and wild type rhodopsin. And on the right are cells that were transduced with the stress sensor and mutant rhodopsin. In this case, the mutant rhodopsin, rhodopsin P23H, causes a blinding disease known as retinitis pigmentosa. And what we can do is analyze the amount of cellular stress from both the wild type and disease state. And what you can see is when we quantify that difference, that there is indeed a significant increase in cellular stress in these disease type uh, cells. And we can also do the same thing using a second protein, the SOD protein, which is involved in ALS. And something I should note is that this data was actually collected using a plate reader, not through imaging. And that's something that's really nice about this assay is that it can be used for your standard epifluorescence or imaging-based technologies, but is also useful for detection on a fluorescent plate reader. The last thing, and I think something that we're really excited about here at Montana Molecular, is being able to simultaneously detect healthy and stressed cells along with second messenger sensors or any other type of signaling pathway that may be happening. 
And the way we do this is by co-transducing uh, cells that either express a single color cell stress sensor, here shown in green, along with a sensor to a second messenger signaler, such as calcium, cyclic AMP, or diacylglycerol. That's neat. So does this take a, a fancy filter set, fancy kinds of microscopes? These images can all be collected on standard epifluorescence microscopes using your standard GFP and RFP filter sets. So they're really applicable to everyone. So what I'm showing you here now is cells that have been transduced with that mutant rhodopsin P23H, that's the mutant that causes retinitis pigmentosa and causes cellular stress, along with a calcium biosensor. And if we separate out these green and red channels, we can look at cellular stress in the green channel and calcium in the red channel. And in the separated channels, the top and bottom are cells that were imaged either prior to stimulation of calcium or post stimulation of calcium. And if we first isolate a what I would call healthy cell, we can look at its cell stress level, in this case the green, which is quite low, as well as its calcium signaling. And what we see in the healthy cell is a pretty standard calcium response, a spike after calcium stimulation followed by a slow decrease. If then we go into the same well and isolate a stress cell, in this case we see a dramatic increase in green fluorescence indicating that the cell is stressed from uh, the rhodopsin mutation. And then we monitor calcium signaling in the red channel, we see a couple of interesting things. The first thing is that the basal or resting levels of calcium have increased quite a bit. And there also appears to be a blunted calcium signaling response. So combining these two assays is a really useful way to understand how either mutations or drugs or compounds that cause cellular stress can also affect other cellular processes such as calcium signaling. So, so Kevin, so I, I, I get it. So the green is the stress, the red's calcium. What, what other kinds of second messengers could you, could you measure with this red signal? Ah, that's a really good question, Tom. So we've measured here calcium, but you could also measure, say, cyclic AMP or cyclic GMP, some other second messenger signalers. You could also look at specific, say, calcium signaling in cellular compartments, such as the mitochondria or even the endoplasmic reticulum. Cool. So with that, we would just like to thank you for listening in about our cell stress sensor today. And if you have any questions, please feel free to either contact us or visit our website at montanamolecular.com.